you are freer than you think. It's like the ultimate form of freedom. You expound upon that freedom to develop on this planet. True freedom comes from within. It's the ability. Thinking to myself, I can help you or I can destroy you. Man is a two-time felon. I work really hard and I've been a, I've been a life learner. When things are feeling tough, let yourself be surprised. The world favors risk-taking. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the Freedom Pact. Today on the show, we are joined by one of psychology's most legendary figures. It's Professor David Buss. David is a professor of psychology at the University of Austin and his work into evolutionary psychology, specifically into human mating, mate selection, mate attraction, and conflicts between the sexes, have led to him winning multiple awards. These include, but are not limited to, being cited more than 70,000 times, being named one of the 50 most influential psychologists in the world, as well as one of the top 30 most influential psychologists living today. Here's what this episode will help you with. We discuss the traits that you should absolutely look to avoid in a partner, as well as the ones which you should seek out. We learn about what happens when there's a ratio imbalance of the sexes. We discuss human nature and how we can leverage it, how men and women differ in their mating strategies, why there is so much conflict amongst the sexes today. We also discuss why there's so much at risk for women when selecting a partner, why there's way more risk for women than there is for men, and what we all can do to give us a better chance of finding and keeping a better mate. I would highly, highly recommend listening to the full full episode as this really does kick into life this episode could save you so much hardship and so much trial and error so without any further ado we're so excited to bring you this please enjoy this conversation with the legendary professor of psychology david bus david it is such a pleasure finally having you on the show. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks. Uh, look forward to chatting with you. You are obviously one of the founders of the field of evolutionary psychology. And I would imagine perhaps one of the most cited ever psychologists. For some context I've got by you that your CV says you've been cited 73,000 plus times. In regards to your studies done into human mating and relationships, I hear from other evolutionary psychologists that they have been deluged with absurd, ridiculous, and insanely personal emails for dating advice. (laughs) Yeah. Has this been an issue for you also? Uh, yeah, I don't, I, I wouldn't say absurd. Um, I think that it, it's one of these perspectives that uh, is, A, both not intuitively obvious to people. And so it actually takes some uh, effort to learn the logic of evolutionary psychology and how it applies appropriately to understanding human mating strategies Uh, And so there are a lot of misconceptions out there. But the other issue that it comes into conflict with or or is is that there's a conventional narrative that in in the social sciences that I think has permeated out to the culture, to to, certainly to Western culture. uh, And that is that we come into this world as a blank slate uh, and that this on this blank slate, uh, the our teachers, our parents, uh, the media, the culture, uh, society writes the script. And, um, and evolutionary psychology, uh, you know, basically shows that this can't be the case. Uh, humans are not blank slates. We are not passive strategists. We are a very active strategist. And we come into this world 
equipped with a menu, in, in the case of what the topic is today, a menu of mating strategies uh, that are implemented in different contexts and so forth. Uh, and so we can get into those in detail. But um, one other source of um, misconceptions that has to be cleared away, and, and perhaps this is some of the source of the uh, more absurd comments that your, your colleague gets at, at Cardiff, uh, is that somehow if things are evolutionary, uh, if our minds are not blank slates, if we have evolved mating strategies, then somehow what that means is that you can't change anything. And that's a fundamental misconception because everything can be changed. And in fact, a deeper knowledge of our evolved psychology gives us the tools to be more effective at changing in the directions we want to change in. And, and one of those has to do with conflict between the sexes, which is a topic I hope we get into in a, in a little detail in this uh, podcast. In more than a little detail, I hope. So before we delve in, I have viewed from other evolutionists, in particular another professor in the field, that we should see evolutionary psychology as descriptive rather than prescriptive. So I guess what he meant by that was in the sense that just because we have evolved in a certain way and we may have a certain preference for one thing, it doesn't necessarily mean that that is destiny so before we you know kick this off i wonder would you agree with the descriptive instead of prescriptive tagline yes yes i do uh, i mean you know evolution by selection uh is in some sense uh it, it's evolutionary psychology is a science a new what i call the new science of the mind and so it, the goal is simply to understand scientifically what are the, uh, in this case, the mating mechanisms, the mating adaptations that exist in our, in our minds, in male and female minds. It's not a prescription for how to go about it or even what is moral. Uh, in fact, I think this is, this is one of the, actually one of the, the other stu interesting stumbling blocks is that evolution by selection has built into us some pretty nasty stuff some good stuff, uh, adaptations for helping, for altruism, for cooperation, uh, for fairness, all kinds of good things. But it's also built into us some nasty stuff, um, adaptations for aggression, for violence, for uh, resolving conflicts through unsavory means. And what people, and, and this again goes against the narrative that people have been taught and like to believe, and that is that somehow humans come into the world intrinsically good, and uh, and that and that all the bad stuff is due to corruption from these external forces like the media, society, bad parenting, bad teachers, and so forth. And what evolutionary psychology argues is that we have adaptations for both within our repertoire, both the good stuff and the bad stuff. And that different environments bring out or evoke different elements of our evolved psychology. And so, in, in short, that's a long-winded answer to your to your question. That I, yes, I agree with your um, the lecturer's uh, description that evolutionary psychology is descriptive. It is a science of the mind. It is not a prescription or prescription for how one should go about. Behaving that that re that resides with uh, values, with morals, uh, with how what kind of society we want to create. That's a different issue. One of the things that you say at the beginning of the evolution of desire is a scientist cannot wish away unpleasant feelings. Man that book and learning about how men and women differ in their mating strategies and i'm telling you man, my body almost went cold at times <laughs> and it's interesting to me that we have evolved with a whole number of evolutionary adaptions we've got traits for altruism for kindness for cooperation like 
you know, Bill Von Hippel talks about in The Social Leap. But it's also clear that we've evolved with things like jealousy and envy. And I suppose, who is anyone to say whether these traits are, are good or bad, right? I mean, evolution doesn't really have a bias. It just cares about survival. So I want to know, why do people try to disown the dark sides of human nature? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and, and I don't know, I don't have, a, uh, I don't have the answer to that. Uh, I, I think that uh, if you look at the history of thought throughout you know, written language at, at any rate, you know, there, there's always been discussion of uh, good and bad, of um, good and evil. And, and this is true in religious texts. I mean, it's true in our uh, legal codes, you know, that we, we, uh, we have legal codes that try to prevent people and impose penalties on people for doing things that we think are bad or evil or don't want them to do. And so, but um, I, I, I guess I could add one thing to that, and that's specific to um, perhaps American and to maybe a little bit lesser extent European social science. And that is, um, in American social science, the field grew up on behaviorism, on basically blank slate behaviorism, and that swept the day. And it, and it, I think, fits in with people's optimism. That is, people want to make the world a better place. We want to we want to cure the evils of society. We want to eliminate violence. We want to eliminate especially sexual violence, you know, violence toward women. I think actually violence toward women is one of the most pressing problems. And we want to eliminate that. But it's really uncomfortable for people to believe that some of the causes of violence and these evil things resides within our nature, not within, you know, the exigencies of the external world. Uh, so, so it's kind of uh, an optimism and a desire for change. And all those are perfectly legitimate. I, you know, there are many evolutionary psychologists and I'm one among them who want to use this knowledge to enact better change to to reduce violence toward women specifically that's actually what i'm working on right now in my in my new book um and i, I talk about that a little bit in my book the evolution of desire uh, although the evolution of desire is is really the foundation for um for everything else when, that we're going to talk about and that's human mating strategies so i think that the first step in all this is to understand the nature of our mating psychology. And if we bury our heads in the sand and don't understand that nature, then making the world a better place and eliminating some of the forms of sexual conflict will be, will be pretty hopeless. You have to have an accurate model of human nature to understand how you can leverage human nature to change things. Yeah, I couldn't agree anymore with that concept of leveraging human nature and almost making our unconscious biases conscious, right? It reminds me of Carl Jung when he said, until you make the unconscious conscious, it will direct your life, and you will call it fate. <laughs> 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 so I'd love to delve in now to what you call the new science of the mind. Simple question, I suppose. <laughs> how would you define evolutionary psychology? Uh, I would define it as uh, a uh, theoretical lens for understanding the origins <clears throat> of the human mind. So um, to be a little bit more specific, uh, we, our, our psychology, our, our mind is housed in our brain. This, this 3.5 uh, pound uh, lump that we carry around with us on our shoulders. And it's, the brain is the most complex organ known, known to humans uh, in, the, in the universe, in the known universe, certainly among living organisms. Uh, and so the question is, well, what causal process created whatever mechanisms our brain houses, whatever mechanism whatever psychological mechanisms are embedded within our brain 
And the only candidate really is, um, the only scientific candidate is evolution by selection. So there, there are other candidates. So of course, um, you know, there's intelligent design or creationism, which posits that a supreme being, uh, magically created this complex, um, you know, structure. And of course that's, that's possible, but it doesn't really help us scientifically to understand the component parts of our mind. And that's what an evolutionary lens does. It says what causal process designed our psychology and in particular sexual selection, the theory of sexual selection is extraordinarily important in understanding our mating psychology uh, and in understanding sex differences within that mating psychology and understanding why men and women get into conflict. So, so this is a long winded uh, answer to your request for a short answer, uh, which is, which is simply that evolutionary psychology uses the, the theoretical tools uh, of modern evolutionary theory to understand the design of the human mind. So we know that evolutionary psychology is the theoretical lens for understanding the origins of the human mind. In terms of the theory of sexual selection, would I be right in saying that this was Darwin? Yes. Yeah, it was actually, yeah. So Darwin's first book was On the Origin of Species. That was 1859. And in that book, he presented the theory of natural selection. And natural selection basically deals with what Darwin called the hostile forces of nature, which are things like um, uh, predators uh, that want to have you for dinner, parasites that you know use your body as their metabolic resources, uh, and then of course uh, the physical environment. So a hostile forces, food shortages, or falls from cliffs, or uh, you know, tsunamis or things like that. Uh, and then of course, another hostile force is other members of your own species. And so what Darwin was centrally concerned with in that first book was survival. His second book, which was, uh, basically described the theory of sexual selection. Uh, it was called the descent, the sexual selection and the, and the descent of man. I could be slightly off on that title, but that was, uh, 12 years later in, in 1871. And that really, I, in some ways, I, I see sexual selection as the more important theory uh, because, uh, because reproduction is, in fact, the bottom line of evolution by selection. Survival is not. Survival is really only a means to an end, so to speak. So you can survive to be 150 years old, but if you don't reproduce, then your, your genes basically hit an evolutionary dead end. And so, uh, and interestingly, and this will start to get us into mating strategies, we have adaptations that actually cause earlier death, and in particular in, in men. Uh, so males have adaptations to take risks. Uh, we have high levels of testosterone compared to women, and these high levels of testosterone compromise the immune system, but they they, they help us in the mating game. Uh, they help pack on muscle. They help us in, in fighting and beating out other males. Uh, they help us in mating motivation to, it, to attract women, but they come at a cost. And so uh, uh, prostate cancer later in life and men in all cultures die earlier than women as a result of this. And this is actually n not unique to humans. It's the uh, same thing is true in cats, by the way. Uh, and cats, male cats die earlier than female cats, except if you castrate the male cats early in life, then they live just as long as the females because they don't get in fights with other males uh, as much. So, um, so, so this is why um, the theory of sexual selection deals not with survival advantage, but rather with mating advantage. And this is what the critical insight that Darwin had was in that 1871 book, uh, is that is that you can have mating advantage that occurs through these two fundamental causal processes. One is what he called intrasexual competition or same-sex competition. And the logic there, the stereotype is two 
stags locking horns in combat. The victor gains sexual access to the female. The loser ambles off with a broken antler and dejected and, and, and mateless. And so the logic of, of this same-sex competition is that whatever qualities lead to success in these battles, um, those qualities get passed on in greater numbers simply because of the sexual access that the victors gain. And the, whatever qualities are associated with losing these battles basically bite the evolutionary dust. They fail to get passed on. And so now this was, this is the way I'm describing this is what Darwin called, uh, or what modern evolutionary biologists call contest competition, where there's literally a physical contest. But the logic is more general than contest competition. Uh, so for example, in our species, in humans, we compete for status and reputation and rank and, and position and power. And those who, who elevate themselves in status, they have a mating advantage. And so you can elevate your status not through physical fights with members of your own species, but through other means. And actually, I have a paper in press on precisely that topic, how people uh, go about increasing their status and also what leads to decrease in status. So, uh, so again, the logic is very clear that because elevation and status is linked with mating advantage, that is, you become more attractive to potential mates, uh, you can com compete for status and qualities that lead to successful competition in status hierarchies basically uh, are selected for because they have a mating advantage. So, so this is um, a long-winded way of saying that the logic of same-sex competition is more general than just these uh, physical contests. Uh, the second component of sexual selection theory is basically boils down to preferential mate choice. Uh, and here, the logic is, it's very simple to describe, but it's so powerful and so interesting. And that is that if members of one sex agree with one another, if there's some consensus about what qualities are desired uh, in the opposite sex, then those who possess those desirable qualities have a mating advantage. They get chosen, they get preferred, those lacking the desired qualities basically struggle and and either remain mateless or or have to settle for lower mate value individuals. And so again, the logic here is that just to give a concrete example of this. Hypothetically, if all women uh, preferred to mate with men who had red hair, then over time you would see an increase in in the in the frequency of redheadedness in the population. Uh, and, and, it, and that's change over time, which is all evolution means is change over time. Uh, you, it, it, and so, uh, and so simply because of preferential mate choice and consensus, some degree of consensus about qualities desired and some heritability to the qualities that are desired, then this process of preferential mate choice can play out and cause, uh, change over time. So basically, both of these causal processes, same-sex competition and preferential bait choice, both are related fundamentally to mating advantage. Beating out rivals in either contests or status gives you a mating advantage. Possessing or acquiring qualities desired by the opposite sex gives you a mating advantage. And so the theory of sexual selection deals with mating advantage, and that's now, of course, you have to survive uh, typically to get to the point of mating. And so sir, I'm not trying to downgrade survival. It's very important, of course. Uh, but without mating, you know, you're basically an evolutionary dead end. So in terms of not becoming an evolutionary dead end, one of the things that you point out in the evolution of desire is that it makes sense for women to be the choosier sex due to the investment differences required. Uh -huh. So I guess if I go out and have unprotected sex with a woman, that could be over in two minutes. You know, <laughs> in fact, if the past is predictive, then, you know, let's say it could be over in 30 seconds if I'm having a really bad night. <laughs> <laughs> but 
on the flip side of that, you know, to get that image out of everyone's minds, the woman could potentially have nine months of childbearing, a life-threatening childbirth. I guess my question to you on this would be, how does um, that investment asymmetry of the sexes impact things? Because I would imagine that would explain, as a general rule, why men throughout history, I imagine, would typically have been the sexual protagonists. Well, yeah. So, okay, you raise you raise a couple really interesting points here. Um, so one point has to do with, uh, and this is, I think, one central point of your question, and that's the asymmetries in uh, what is technically called obligatory parental investment. And all that simply means is um, what is the minimum investment a man or a woman has to put in to produce a, sing a single child? And you're absolutely right. For women, it's that heavy nine-month investment, and it's obligatory in the sense that women don't have a choice about it. They can't say, well, I'm really busy with my career now. I only want to put in two months. I mean, it's part of our reproductive biology that nine month investment. And for men, it's basically an act of sex at a, at a bare minimum or, or the investment required to attract a sex partner at a minimum. Okay. But the, the, the qualification here, the very important qualification is that what we're focusing on here. And, and I think your question was focusing on is short term mating. Okay. As, as in a hookup, a ca casual sex partner, and that's absolutely true. Uh, but we have more than just short-term mating in a repertoire. Uh, we have what I call a menu of mating strategies that includes short-term sexual encounters, uh, but also includes long-term committed mating, also includes uh, serial mating, so mating with one partner, breaking up, mating with another partner. That's very, very common in our species. Um, and then we also have uh, mixed mating strategies like uh, what's technically called EPCs or extra pair copulations, where you're in a relationship, a mating relationship with one person, but then have sex with someone outside the relationship, uh, either as a um, like a one night stand or as a, a more prolonged affair. And there things get really complicated because the issue that you brought up that women, it's more costly for women to make a bad choice in short term mating is absolutely correct. So uh, at least and certainly would have been ancestrally and probably as currently as well. Uh, but in long term mating where both sexes are invest, investing heavily in children, uh, both sexes are very, very choosy. And so you get uh, what's called mutual mate choice in long-term mating. Um, whereas in short-term mating, yeah, uh, in short-term mating, there are a lot more men that are interested in casual sex and short-term mating. So just to give a concrete number to it, uh, the dating app Tinder, which is widely regarded as um, a tilting toward more of a hookup um, uh, dating app, 70% of the people on Tinder are men and 30% are women. And so, and I read one statistic that said that 30% of the men on Tinder are actually married already. And so they're looking for some sex on the side. Uh, and so, um, but um, you know, what that means is, well, why are men like that? What, well, why men are like that is, is because over evolutionary time, the, uh, sex that invests less in offspring, in this case males, uh, tends to be highly competitive for sexual access to the sex that invests more. And so mating opportunities for the low investing sex are extraordinarily valuable. And so men have a, have a very rich psychology of, uh, you know, basically going through hell and high water uh, to tap dance, do songs, dances, play guitar, become famous rock stars, athletes, etc. all in part because this leads to greater sexual access to women. And, uh, you know, one kind of x-ray into this 
has to do with sex differences in the nature of male and female pornography. Uh, so if you if you look at male pornography, the things that men like to uh, like to look at online, there are things like, uh, well, of course, attractive women, but multiple women, uh, and multiple women who engage in in sex with little foreplay, you know, uh, after meeting uh, and multiple partner switching, often and and desire for sexual variety. So it's pretty well documented that that men have a greater desire for sexual variety. So one statistic on this is uh, even in, in private sexual fantasies, do you change partners in the course of a single sexual fantasy episode? Uh, and men are, are uh, four times more likely to do so. Um, so that is the desire for different women just simply because they're different. Uh, and of course, men who had sexual access to different uh, women left more descendants than than men who did not. So, but that's that's this deals with, you know, as I said, short term mating, not long term mating. And, and and these are this is a huge huge theoretical difference because the qualities that men and women want in short term versus long term mating differ. Uh, to some degree, not entirely, but they differ to some degree. And the strategies that we use to attract partners also differ depending on whether you're going after a long-term romantic relationship or, you know, a short-term hookup. Yeah, that is fascinating to me. And I guess that one of the things that would no doubt have an impact on the mating strategies of the sexes is the environment and um, the ratio of men to women. Uh-huh. So, as an anecdote, my university has a ratio of 59% women to 41% men, which I say through nostalgic, honey glazed eyes. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember many years back, I read The Game by Neil Strauss, which is. As far as I'm aware, probably the most notorious men's dating book that has ever existed. Um, And I think that one of the things that Strauss mentions is that women will basically look for reasons to not sleep with a man. Mm -hmm. But also that the reverse, I imagine, would be true in the sense that men would typically have to have reasons to not sleep with a woman. And if I remember correctly in that book, I think that Strauss even says something to the point of don't talk her out of hooking up with you, which I imagine is due to his knowledge of women's evolved mating strategies, right? So is there, you know, any sense in the statement of women will look for points to mate with a male? Whilst for men to not mate with a woman, they would have to have points not to. Yeah, yeah. I think I I would um, phrase it a little bit differently, but I think that is uh, you are tapping into something very real. Uh, one way that I would phrase it is that women have more uh, deal breakers than men. So, so yeah. So just a couple examples, like if the guy has bad breath. Uh, that can be a deal breaker or if she doesn't like the way he smells that can be a deal breaker uh, or if he's um, rude to the uh, to the person who's who's waiting on the table where they're sitting that can be a deal breaker uh, men when it comes to casual sex men have fewer deal breakers uh, and they also um, men are so, so one other aspect of this is that men that women maintain very high standards uh, in short-term and long-term mating, whereas men tend to maintain high standards in long-term mating, but they drop them dramatically in short-term mating. And as long as the costs and risks are low enough, uh, men are willing to engage in short-term mating with a a wide variety of women, whereas women are still very choosy when it comes to short-term mating. Yeah, I think that we've covered why 
typically males have to be their sexual protagonists really well. I think that we've explained why women would be the choosier sex due to the asymmetric risks to rewards. They are essentially risking their lives, right? I mean, when they give birth. So I think that this is going to sound like an absurd question. If women maintain high standards in long-term and short-term mating, and they have more deal-breakers than men, is there perhaps a Pareto, an 80-20 going on, in which 80% of the women could be going after perhaps the top 20% of men? Uh, yeah, I think there is some validity to that. I, I'm not sure I would attach exact percentages to it, but 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 let me let me circle back to that uh, because this is related to another point that you raised with your question of the sex ratio imbalance when you were at university, um, and this is a critical critical variable uh, because when there's a surplus of women, which it sounds like you mentioned, 59% women. Um, and, um, so I remember this is just a anecdote. I gave a talk at a university here in Texas called uh, Texas Christian university, and they have a sex ratio that is roughly the same there. It's a uh, 60% women, 40% men. And so I gave my talk on human mating strategies and, and in the context of spending a day there, I talked to a number of undergraduate, uh, women and, and men. And, um, and the women basically said uh, that men at TCU, that's the acronym for Texas Christian University, that men who were normally a five in the mate value scale in any other context are an eight at TCU. Because what, what, what that means is, you know, that, that uh, when there's a surplus of women, women have to ramp up their competition for the smaller number of men. Uh, that are there because there aren't enough men to go around. And one of the ways in which they do that is to uh, increase their sexuality. So they, they dress in skimpier clothing, they sexualize their physical appearance, they're more willing to have casual sex, etc. when there's a surplus of women. Uh, when there's a surplus of men, it, it shifts the other way around. It shifts more to long-term mating. And men, when there's a surplus of men, men who are fortunate enough to succeed in attracting women, basically hold on for dear life and do everything they can to successfully retain that woman. So, um, so, so now, uh, now when it comes to the, uh, the 80, 20 issue you, you mentioned, this is very interesting because there, there have been studies done, uh, of this sort of thing where, where like on, uh, on internet dating sites like like OkCupid and, uh, uh, and and others, where they just look at things like how many women on the site do men find attractive? What does the distribution look like? And then they have women. You know, what is the percentage of men that they find attractive? And there, you're right. Women tend to find the top twenty percent of men attractive, and the bottom eighty percent tend to be now, below threshold, whereas men find 50% or above to be above threshold. Uh, and so another way of saying that is that men find women, the average woman, to be more attractive than women find the average man. I find that so interesting that the average man finds the average woman more attractive. <laughs> so let's look back and explore the effects of gender imbalances. An example of this is I, myself, Joe, went out to Nepal with my co-host, Lewis, and Nepal, if anyone Googles it, they have one of the highest gender imbalances in the world. I believe it perhaps could even be one million more women than men, although don't quote me on that, but I know it's high. And my tour guide, Bikram, who my guess is he probably has one of the best jobs in the country. This guy is in fantastic physical shape. He has extraordinary resources and contacts, spoke multiple languages, as you know, as well as being a, a physically attractive guy. So he told me when I was out there, you know, and to paraphrase what he said, he basically 
mention that he had more or less the pick of the bunch of the available Nepalese women. <laughs> yeah. Even in a scenario like that where Bikram, you know, who's got all these options, he mentions to me he's in his early or mid-30s now. He's got a buffet of options to choose from, but he's still a single guy. So I suppose that that makes me think, when there is such an imbalance, does that lead to shorter-term mating? Yes, a- absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, more short-term mating strategies. And I remember um, not too long ago, I, I, in a different context, I bumped into a guy who was now, a, he was now a professional, but he had gone to TCU as an undergraduate. And as he was reminiscing about his days there, he got this glazed look in his eyes as he remembers that he was never uh, higher in mate value than when he was an undergraduate at TCU. Be precisely because of that sex ratio imbalance. So, uh, I mean, and so this is, I mean, this is, see, my, the, my book, The Evolution of Desire, it's not, it's not really meant as a self-help book, but uh, I think as you implied earlier, uh, readers can use the information to improve their mating lives, for sure. You know, and one of the ways to do it is to go to places where there's a favorable sex ratio. Uh, the rarer sex is always higher in mate value, higher in demand than the more frequent sex. In The Evolution of Desire, you mentioned that men are very visual and are typically attracted by things like beauty and signs of fertility, whereas a woman's attraction to a man is largely dependent on things like context. Yes, what is the evolutionary purpose of women being attracted to a man based on context? Well, that, that's uh, that's a great question and a complicated one. So let me let me take a, a couple stabs at it here. Uh, so so one is that uh, you're you're absolutely right in your starting point. So men are very visual creatures when it comes to mating, and the, the our visual sense, the what the woman looks like. Kind of overpowers, you know, pretty much all other senses. Women are more complicated when it comes to that. So with women, as I alluded to earlier, sense of smell is very important. Uh, nonverbal behavior is very important. Sense of touch is very important. Uh, women use all their senses in in detecting this, and part of that has to do with uh, with sex differences in what leads to successful mating or or more precisely historically what has led to successful mating over human evolutionary history and for men you can say uh, if you were in a business school uh, they they talk about what is job one you know and that's what is the first thing you have to do to succeed Uh, and for men ancestrally job one is selecting a fertile partner so uh, men who fail to select select a fertile partner basically failed to reproduce and so what but women don't walk around with their fertility number glowing on their forehead uh you know all women all all ancestral men had available to them were the physical and behavioral cues that were statistically correlated with fertility which is inherently unobservable and so what are those physical cues? Well, uh, they're, in behavioral, there are things like smooth skin, clear skin, clear eyes, uh, lustrous hair, uh, somewhat longer hair, um, full lips, uh, white teeth, uh, absence of uh, sores or lesions, uh, uh, symmetrical features, uh, and then and then behaviorally things like um, you know a sprightly gait. Uh, you can. You can tell someone's age by, by even from a distance by how they walk. So, so younger people have a sprightlier gait. And of course, youth is highly correlated with fertility. And fertility in men and women shows very di- different age distributions. For women, uh, it basically uh, peaks at, you know, uh, you know, at around uh, early to mid-20s uh, and then declines Thereafter, men have a longer shelf life and fertility. So some men in their 40s, 50s, 60s, and even 70s 
uh, can and occasionally do reproduce. I think I, Clint Eastwood is, I think, just turned 90. But I think when he was in his 70s, he had another kid. Uh, so, um, so, uh, so the point is fertility, identifying a fertile mate has never been a big problem for women. There's no shortage of sperm is another way to, is a blunt way to put it. Uh, but for men, uh, selecting a fertile mate's always been a big problem, uh, that they have to solve and they've solved it by, solved it by not, obviously not consciously, but by finding attractive those cues that are statistically correlated with fertility. Uh, now for women's mate choice, it's, it's considerably more complicated. So, so yeah, they don't want an infertile mate, uh, of course, but what they want is basically two clusters of things. They have to identify w which are complicated. One is they have to identify a guy who has resources, but not only that, a guy who has a good future resource trajectory uh, that is a guy who's going somewhere, uh, who has ambition, drive, and so forth, but also a guy who's willing to devote those resources to her and her children, who's willing to commit, who's willing to fall in love with her, who does fall in love with her. In fact, women use love as a cue to, as a cue to commitment. Uh, and, and so, and so that, that external set of things, resources and their devotion to her is one cluster of things. But a second one is, is genes, good quality genes. So for example, genes for good health that can then be passed on to her children or uh, genes for uh, quality, other successful qualities such as intelligence or uh, ability to get ahead, get ahead in status hierarchies that will be passed on to her children. Uh, and so all these issues, uh, and uh, r related to the first one and the second one is, will this guy remain loyal to her? Or is he gonna cheat on her? Is he gonna devote resources uh, to other women? Is he gonna leave her for another woman? Uh, all these things have to be evaluated and so women's mate selection process is a lot more complicated than men's. And that's why, to get back to your uh, original question, that's why it's more context dependent. Uh, and, and so I'll give you just a, an example or two of the sort of context dependence of women's compared to men's mate selection. So and, and this is a, a story. So a woman that I know, an evolutionary psychologist, very successful, uh, very attractive. She was just telling me that she uh, met this guy at a conference and, and the guy was the organizer of the conference and she found him very attractive. Uh, and, uh, and then she met him again six months later and that was it. She didn't sleep with him or anything, but she met him again six months later and he was just a regular attendee at a different conference. And she thought to herself, what, well, why did I find him attractive? I don't, this guy just seems very ordinary. And, and the reason was, well, as the organizer of the conference, he had a lot of status. He, all the eyes were focused on him. Uh, and so, and so a man, take a man, uh, exactly the same man and put him in two different con contexts and women will find him to be attractive in one, not attractive in another. So even like with, uh, sports stars or, or successful athletes, if women know that he's a successful athlete. They've seen him, you know, I don't know, score a goal in, you know, with Manchester United or something, uh, versus she meets the same guy and she she's, doesn't recognize him, she doesn't follow sports and he's just some guy, doesn't find him attractive. And so, and so the, the status context is, is one uh, that, that is very important. Uh, uh, men, uh, so, so another way of saying that is that men's attractiveness to women varies tremendously across different social contexts, whereas um, women's attractiveness to men varies far less because men are just focusing more heavily on those physical cues. So, so just a quick example of that. So, you know, and I've experienced this this myself. So I, I do I I. I I, I don't have an infinite variety of contexts, but I, I have uh, academic contexts. I also ride motorcycles, and so sometimes I hang out with motorcycle people. 
Uh, and, um, you know, I, I play sports, so I play tennis, squash, and some other sports. So I have some sporting things. And so, uh, and so I, I, you take the same woman and put her in an academic context or in a sporting context or in a motorcycle group, and if she's attractive, if she has those fertility cues, men will find her attractive in all three of those contexts. But the, but the man will be differently attractive in those contexts. So even, for example, within academic contexts, uh, if I'm at a meeting of um, evolutionists, I have a lot higher status in those meetings um, than if I'm at, a let's say, a conference of sociologists where evolutionary psychology is not as prominent, or if I'm at a, I don't know, a physics conference where no one knows who I am. So, uh, and then you go to the, let's say the motorcycle context. Well, I don't have the, the best motorcycle, the fanciest motorcycle, and I'm not the best motorcycle rider in, in the groups that I hang out with. And so I have a lower status in that context and women in that context don't find me quite as attractive. So, uh, any man who's gone through uh, multiple social contexts can attest to the variability of their attractiveness to women, uh, whereas you know women's attractiveness is more constant across those contexts. Yeah, and look, as a man that has been through a variety of those contexts, I can absolutely attest to that. I would love to talk with you about how evolution impacts our mating choices today so one example that i'm thinking about is let's look at something like muscularity if i am a muscular guy then i imagine that if we went back to say homo erectus then that would show that i'm diligent i'm a good hunter i'm able to acquire the calories necessary i'm conscientious i'm resourceful it's almost like a hack in the system right it's like a hack in the evolutionary system so would muscularity perhaps be a male adaptive mating mechanism yeah uh, yes yeah and i would add to that uh the protection so one of the key things that women are looking for is a guy who's going to protect them or have the ability to protect them and so that and so physical fitness, being in good shape, uh, not being able to get downed by other men, uh, and also showing psychologically that you have the bravery or courage to step up and offer that protection and not be downed by other men. That's very important. So, but yeah, athleticism uh, and physical formidability have always been very important uh, qualities to women, both in resource acquisition as in large game hunting and for protection. Very, very, very interesting. I am placing my order with my protein as we speak. <laughs> One topic I would love to pick up with you on is that I've heard you previously discuss the dark triad test. So, for those that don't know, this is a test that scores people on uh, narcissism, psychopathy, and Machiavellianism. I would imagine that these are traits that most people would like to avoid in a long-term partner, probably even a short-term partner. So thinking about this has really made me reflect, and it makes me think that a trait like emotional stability avoiding oscillation and instability is actually perhaps a hugely underrated trait when it comes to selecting a potential partner so david you have studied this stuff obviously for so so long i wonder besides the dark triad of narcissism psychopathy and machiavellianism are there any other traits that you believe we should look to avoid in a potential mate Yes. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and I think this, this applies to both men and women. And the one that I would single out is emotional stability, which you, you allude to there. Uh, and that's something that in my study of 37 cultures uh, came up very, very high in both sexes, a bit more, for, more important for women than for men. 
But uh, emotional stability has these, uh, uh, one of the hallmarks is precisely the one that you mentioned, that is, we all experience setbacks, we all experience failures, we all experience disappointments, and the issue is, do you rally from setback? You know, do you spring back quickly and, and recover? And people who are emotionally unstable, they get, um, they get set back for longer periods by these trials and tribulations of everyday life that we all face. Uh, and so, um, and so, you know, being emotionally stable is so important for, uh, succeeding in long-term goals. Uh, also being involved with an emotionally unstable person, uh, they inflict so many costs. This is what I call in the, my jargon relationship load. So in other words, like if you're in a relationship with someone, all relationships, people provide benefits. They also carry some costs. And people who are emotionally unstable have a higher load of costs that they inflict on their partner. They get moody. Uh, they get out of sorts. They have to be pampered more heavily. And so they require devoting a larger chunk of your time and attention and energy to soothing their frayed nerves um, and moods compared to emotionally stable people. So they can be draining is, is another way to, another way to put it. Um, in addition to that personality trait of emotional instability, undermining successful long-term goals. So, and I, I've seen this, I see this even in my graduate students. So, um, I've had I've, roughly 30 PhD students that I've supervised over the years. And Almost all of them are super smart. They're very talented, uh, very intellectually engaged. Uh, but I've seen the most, some of the most talented ones, if they had, even if they're talented, creative, and hardworking, if they're emotionally unstable, that will undermine their success in work. Uh, and so, uh, whereas emotionally stable people, if they have those other qualities, intelligence and hard work, they will succeed and get ahead. And so it's also a predictor of who's going to get ahead in the status hierarchy. That is so interesting to me. Do you have any other traits that you would like us to avoid? Yeah, well, I would say there's a personality trait uh, that's called, a, it's in a dementia called agreeableness uh, and disagreeableness. So the people at the agreeable end of it are, are kind, cooperative, altruistic, helpful, et cetera, on the disagreeable end, they tend to be aggressive, hostile, uh, you know, in a word, cost inflicting. Uh, and so these are uh, people on the disagreeable end tend to be nastier uh, customers, so to speak, and nastier mates. And, and, and I found in my studies of uh, newlywed couples and dating couples that people who are disagreeable and emotionally unstable, that those are key predictors of a lot of conflict in relationships. Uh, those, the disagreeable ones also are more likely to be unfaithful. And so you want to avoid, you want to avoid that. I mean, you want to, in long-term mating, you want a partner who's going to be true to you. David, I have loved, loved speaking to you so much. Your achievements in this field of psychology are phenomenal. You are clearly an outlier. Um, a simple Google search will show that, you know, you are, I mean, I, I saw a Google search earlier that said you're the seventh most influential psychologist of all time. Um, this has been, you know, just such a treat. It's such a privilege to be able to bring you to the show. What would be one thing that you would love people to take away from evolutionary psychology within the context of human mating well 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 thank you that i i i think that the seventh most influential psychologist uh in the world is undoubtedly a gross exaggeration uh, uh but um but um but yeah i'm i'm happy that people have found my work interesting and, and useful uh but you know boy one piece of advice on mating you know i think that uh i think that especially for men, uh, men don't give the process of mate selection enough careful consideration. 
that is a lot of men think, well, you know, all I have to do is sort of get ahead at work and succeed uh, at work and in my profession, and then, and then the mating will kind of take care of itself. Uh, whereas women tend to give it a lot more thought. You know, even the uh, courses that I teach, the undergraduates I teach, uh, 80% of the people in my class are women. Uh, and for some reason, and you know, if I were an undergraduate, I, boy, I'd want to sign up for this class because it's so, it's, it's so useful. But women, you know, are devoting more attention and more care to the mate selection process. But I think men should do that as well. And so I, in, in a way, I think that um, men prioritize physical appearance too much. Now, we've evolved to prioritize it because it provides that wealth of information about uh, fertility. Uh, but I think we prioritize it too much in long-term mating because successful long-term mating, if you really want successful happiness, you have to attend to those personality variables uh, that I just mentioned. So uh, you want an agreeable partner. You want a conscientious partner. You want an emotionally stable partner. Uh, and you want, you want a partner who, um, who will not be – uh, not behind the dark triad. That is, you don't want someone who's overly narcissistic or Machiavellian because, say, narcissism, to take an example, they will prioritize their needs and put your needs at a distant fourth or fifth. So you want someone, you want an equal partner. And so, and so I think that one of the ways in which men go wrong is because they prioritize physical attractiveness so much, they tend to overlook these more important qualities that are more important in long-term mating. Uh, so, uh, so that that would be the one piece of advice I would give to men, or one 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 takeaway. I think that 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 women may need less advice uh, because they already give it a lot of thought. Uh, but even women can can learn about these things. I think women sometimes get swept up by very charming uh, narcissistic guys who have this superficial charm and are very good at seduction but are not necessarily good at long-term mating. So, yeah, so I guess I'm taking back what I just said. I think women need to attend to these personality variables just as much as men do. As I mentioned earlier, I want to link everybody below to your fascinating article on the mating crisis amongst educated women, which, for me, I think it's just an absolutely incredible read. Yeah, thank you. You mentioned at the beginning that you are working on a new book. Before we look at that, what books have impacted your life, David? Uh, well, I would say uh, Charles Darwin's book on sexual selection theory, 1871, is one. Um, Don Simon's book, 1979, The Evolution of Human Sexuality, an absolutely brilliant book. And um, uh, it, it had a huge impact on my own work. And even, even now, uh, many years later, I've been working in this field studying human mating strategies for many, many years, as you know. Um, uh, whenever I tackle a new topic like, a, like conflict between the sexes or sexual coercion, I always go back to Don Simon's book, The Evolution of Human Sexuality, and say, well, what, is, what does Don Simons have to say about it? Because it's invariably, not that he has the last word and not that he's always right, but he is invariably insightful. Uh, and so I think that was really, uh, it's really one of the best books that's ever written, been written about the evolution of human sexuality. Uh, now my book, my book, The Evolution of Desire, is a bit broader. So it includes sexuality, but is, is a bit more widely framed in terms of our mating strategies. Um, so uh, so those would be, those would be, two books so darwin and don simons that i would mention oh thank you so much for sharing that and i wonder could you tease us with any details of the new book because i will undoubtedly be reaching out for the part two uh yeah i can mention it briefly uh so the the new book is exclusively on conflict between men and women the battle of the sexes and it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a topic that I have one chapter on in the evolution of desire. And basically, it's, it's such an interesting and complicated and important topic that I decided I needed to write a whole book about it. And so uh, people can get a taste of it 
in the evolution of desire because I devote a pretty hefty chapter to it there. But that's what it's on. So it's on things like uh, the conflict on the mating market, so deception, the ways in which men and women deceive each other in online dating, um, conflict within relationships, uh, where I get into topics like relationship load and infidelity and sexual jealousy and uh, financial infidelity. Then breakups, because most people go through romantic breakups. About 85% of us go through romantic breakups, at least one. Um, and uh, things that uh, intimate partner violence, sexual coercion, uh, stalking in the aftermath of a breakup. Uh, so basically, it's kind of like a, the, what I call the dark side of, of human nature. The dark side of human mating is what the whole book's about. And how to resolve conflict between the sexes. So ways in which we can reduce the battle of the sexes and get rid of some of these things like violence, sexual violence toward women, which I think is, is uh, pervasive and uh, appalling and has some evolutionary roots which can help us to, uh, to fix it. So, so anyway, in, in short, the new book's all about conflict between the sexes and how to deal with it. Could you tell our audience any way in which they could connect with you and also perhaps when the book may be hit in the shelves? Uh, yeah, so the book is um, almost through with it. So the book was probably about, uh, there's usually a six month publication lag. So, uh, so I'd say toward the end of this year or early, uh, early next year. But the best way to connect to my work is through my website, which is my name, davidbuss.com. So it's David and then B-U-S-S, -S, so no spaces, davidbuss.com. And on that website, I have links to uh, um, all my books. I have links also to some interviews that I've done. And I also have links to all of my scientific articles, which can be downloaded for free. Uh, so and that, that would be under publications. And uh, so, th so that's really, so davidbuss.com, you just Google that and, and that'll take you to my website. David, this has been such a treat for me. You and I, we've been in conversation to make this happen for quite a while and it was certainly worth the wait. I have such a strong admiration for you and the work in which you've done. And man, look, I, I've genuinely just cannot thank you enough for taking the time to come on it has been a real real pleasure well thank you it's been it's been wonderful chatting with you and and you're a great interviewer <laughs>